First of all, I would like to uh, to thank all the speakers for providing yeah, very stimulating talks that um, have already had the effect of vibrant discussions. And um, I don't think you really need me anymore, but okay. <laughs> So secondly, I would like to ask Andrea uh, to thank Andrea and Ruben for asking me to comment on and synthesize the papers of this first section. This section aimed at investigating the association between the two entities, Greek city-states and the environment. We have four presentations that can methodologically be categorized into two broad fields. The presentations by Hans and Ruben cover the field from the perspective of the literary traditions while the presentations by Anton and Lou examine the topic from an archaeological perspective. An archaeological perspective at the intersection with the natural sciences. This carefully compiled panel achieves in bringing in new perspectives on different aspects of the highly entangled human environment relationship whereby unsuspected overlaps reveal themselves. The first talk of the section was given by Hans Beck with an eco-critical paper on Aesop's Logoi. Hans aimed at investigating the relationship between the concept of the environment, that is the natural environment, and the perception of landscape and environment of Aesop's readers. During the analysis, a number of interesting and new insights are made. The paper starts off with the observation that scholars have acknowledged that Aesop is not only about the fables, but that there's another layer to it that is a political one. He goes on investigating the question if other layers can be detected focusing on the subject of the natural environment. Hans notices a sort of scientific approach in Aesop when he talks about flora and fauna that can be detected especially well in the use of the very specific language Aesop uses. Hans then goes on to explore the nature of the environment, the thesis to Tofu, that Aesop presents. He observes that Aesop develops rather stereotypical, easily relatable pictures of localities, something Hans calls meta-environments, on the one hand, but that these are highly localized on the other hand. This observation is of course in need of an explanation, and Hans goes on to develop the idea that Aesop had concrete places in mind when writing the fables, places that might be localized in the ocean. I'm not going to reiterate the arguments here. Suffice to say that connections to the ocean can be found on several levels. This paper is novel and thought-provoking, especially in two respects for me. The first one being the argument for the concrete natural environment being the backdrop for the fables. For the conceptual, conceptualization of environment in the early Greek world, this is important because it would attest for an environmental discourse in a hitherto unknown way. The fact that later experts on nature refer to Aesop as an authority underlines the importance of nature, landscapes, and the environment in Aesop's Logoi further and sheds a new light on the apparently very complex character of the work. By proposing the idea that the landscape Aesop has in mind is Yosha, Hans makes sense of what he calls hyper-localized observations in the fables. This to me is the most compelling part of the paper, and I'm eager to learn if more passages might be identifiable for decoding in that way. One would love to see, and we talked about this yesterday, a study combining the literary approach to the flora and fauna with a paleoclimatological one in order to find out if the characteristics of the natural environment mapped out by Aesop match with the paleo-environmental data of the ocean. One last point I would like to highlight in Hans's paper is the reciprocal view that is adopted, a view that new environmental history advocates for strongly. This was a neat example of a study investigating not only how humans influence their environment, but also how the specific environment resonated back to the people living in it. The thesis to talk. The second paper in this session was delivered by Anton Bonnier. Anton presented some of the results of his broader work on climate variability and land use strategies. This is one of the two papers of the session that are based on paleoclimatological data obtained by an archaeometric um, by archaeometric analysis. The results presented by Anton today are part of a larger project that takes into account data from different places in Attica and the Peloponnese 
thereby considering the situations on a regional level, but also on a micro-regional one. The main focus of his paper today, however, was on the Peloponnese and on Attica. In his study, he compares the results from paleoclimatological analyses he has carried out on samples taken primarily from three caves on the Peloponnese with the results from field survey that has identified rural sites. In this methodologically carefully executed study, he finds that there is a correlation between climate change and changes in the settlement structure. During periods of wetter climate, a maximum increase of land use expansion can be observed, while in drier periods, a strategy away from sloping grounds is detectable. In his discussion of the findings, he stresses that climate change can, however, not be identified as the primary driver behind landscape change, and we discussed this at length after his paper. This important study and the project it relates to highlights once more the great potential of the integration of archaeometry when discussing land use strategies of the past. Now, I jotted down the question that it would be interesting to see if these results are applicable to other regions of other communities reacted differently to plot possible climate changes. And um, with regard to the panel, tied to the title of the panel, it would be interesting to discuss further the role of the polis and other possible agents in these scenarios. Um, with, the, uh, with regard to the question of the applicability, I think enough has been said in the discussion, and uh, but maybe we want to come back to that. So this last um, aspect, the question of agents in these scenarios, was targeted in the first paper after the coffee break today, delivered by Ruben. Ruben asked the question if the ancient Greek astrometeorological, and I struggle with that word, <laughs> calendar, now this paragmata, played a role in the management of abnormal climate conditions. In his very well argued and outlined paper, he makes sense wonderfully of the strange phenomenon that are the parapegmata and their popularity as attested for by their widespread use. The para um, one of the fields of application were the use by civic officials. The parapegmata, according to Rubin, quote, conferred on civic officials greater authority to, de to determine <coughs> uh, when weather had progressed from being normal to abnormal and when interventions were necessary, unquote. In this way, those calendars can be viewed as a part of risk adverting or risk mitigating really strategy of the polis and the quest for increasing the resilience against agrarian crises. The one thing I couldn't get my head around after reading your paper in for the preparation, um, and we discussed this yesterday, was the discrepancy between the obvious non-reliability of those texts when it came to concrete forecasting, and if that wouldn't have put officials referring to them in a difficult position after a while. So someone must have noticed these things do not help. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we talked about this already, but maybe you want to elaborate um, on this further. Um, yeah, your paper also got me thinking further. <laughs> Um, about the main topic of the section, that is the association between the polis and the environment. So where else can we observe such concrete interactions between the two? In, these, uh, in this context, please allow me to very briefly share with you some thoughts from my own area of research, and this is only one paragraph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is Athenian resource management and exploitation in ancient Laurion. In my dissertation, I traced process optimization strategies in the silver pro uh, production process and encountered these on most steps of the chaîne de laboratoire. What neither I nor others had so far thought about it sufficiently, I think, was the role of the polis as agent in such strategies that, of course, always directly involve the natural environment, be it deep mining technologies, water management, or the milling of the ore, washing and smelting of the raw materials, in order to produce silver. During the preparation of this workshop, I realized that the agents and mechanism, mechanisms of these processes basically lie in the dark. It's a bit late to realize that, but <laughs> you know. Um, did, for example, individual workshop owners came up with an innovation that gradually caught on, or were mining engineers employed by the polis in order to think about how most could be made of the exploitation of the natural environment? Historical evidence for this is, of course, lacking. 
but the uh, layout uh, and papers of the workshops have prompted this debate for me and maybe these last remarks also bring another facet to the uh, conversations we are having today. So the second paper from the realm of archaeometry was presented by Lou Godfroy, which nicely brings us back to the earlier parts of Greek history, to the age of the so-called Greek colonization. And I hope you can hear me, Lou. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to congratulate you on a very exciting dissertation project, and thank you for agreeing to share some of your results and thoughts with us, which, as I understand, was a rather spontaneous decision. So we are all the more thankful that you gave us some insights into your much welcomed ongoing research on agricultural practices in the Greek world. Lou is looking at the organization of agriculture and animal husbandry through the lens of floral and faunal remains. Her approach is a comparative one, juxtaposing the situation in the Greek homeland and in colonies on the Italian peninsula. Her aim is to investigate further the level of interaction between the two to find the Greek, and I put that of course in quotation marks, in the South Italian settlement and asks if autochthonous, another difficult word, practices from there resonated back. She not only rightly considers all published vegetational and faunal remains from excavations in her research, but also took samples herself from three, I think, places in Greece and Italy, which she presented to us as case studies. As she rightly stresses, um, archaeobotanical studies still, uh, are still underrepresented in the archaeology of the Iron Age Aegean, and Greece in particular. So the new data she provides is already an, advance, already an advancement in knowledge. She concludes that differences in agricultural approaches can indeed be observed, such as the development of a multi-cropping strategy in southern Italy versus large-scale cultivation in Greece. That is, if I understood you correctly, because, yeah, the sound wasn't always very good. Um, so the paper presented to you uh, by you, Lou, is indeed very thought-provoking, and I would like to highlight the fact that with your thesis, you will contribute not only to the immediate realm of early Greek history, but also to broader debates on the role of food in the context of colonization, a topic that Michael Dietler has engaged in highly, for example. Or maybe um, so a couple of questions also arose for me, um, but as I think you are not, you can't really hear us, maybe <laughs> that's not really the, the right place and um, yeah, maybe I, I will send it to you in a, uh, via email. So I will jump to my conclusion, which is probably not too bad because we only have a couple of minutes left before the lunch break. So I would like to wrap up my response by pointing out some overlaps between the papers. Firstly, the papers by Hans and Rubin have in common that both clearly carve out the fact that discourses on the environment existed that we would not have expected previously. In the case of Aesop, it is the discourse in an unsuspected format, the fable. Not only that, but that the author of the fable is even acknowledged as an authoritative figure by the Nestor of the natural sciences himself, in the case of the meteorological calendars, it is the very well argued possibility that those calendars were actually used by officials lending authority to the authors of such work. Seasonality and resilience was also a topic touched by several of the contributions. What resonated particularly well with me, however, was the question of the agents of the human environment relationship that Ruben was mapped out so well. In other contexts, however, it seems to me that this is something particularly difficult to grasp, as I elaborated on when I talked about Laurium. And uh, I think this is a problem that Anton and Lou may also deal with, and or maybe have already solved. Uh, so I'm keen to hear what you have to say about this. And with these last remarks, I thank you for your attention.